that's my face. That's what I look like. I'm not much for video and we're concentrating on the things we're presenting here. So I often do not share video and there's no requirement that you share video here, but welcome to Math 261. This is Analytic Geometry and Calculus 3 at Delta College. It's the 2021 fall semester. Today is Tuesday, August 31st. And this is our first class session. So it has to be naturally disorganized. Let me, now on my screen right here, I'm concentrating on my paper. Now, you can allow in Zoom, whatever you wanna concentrate on, but generally you can concentrate on the paper. You know, I am my desktop now, I'm looking at my face in my paper. If I wanted to add my whiteboard here, now I have my face, my paper, my whiteboard, but that does not indicate how you are consuming this. So you consume our recording, you consume our session if you're here live as you wish, but I'm going to turn off my video. I'm in my office at Delta College and I'm going to just focus on the paper so I can see what you see. Uh, someday I'll show you my setup right here, but basically I have some household wire bent into a phone holder, which is pointing at the paper right here in my hand. So this is my desk. Uh, I think I could lift this and show you without damaging anything. So that's just some 12 gauge wire bent into a little phone holder. And then over there, I got an iPad pointed at a whiteboard. And right here is my computer, which is kind of running stuff. Uh, everybody has invented their own space during this time. So if you've got something creative or useful, uh, I don't mind you sending me a picture or sharing it later because uh, you might have some very good ideas that I haven't thought about. But I think often I'm gonna be here on the paper. Sometimes I'm pulling over to the whiteboard because I might have something pre-written there, or, you know, that's what whiteboards and chalkboards are for, to do scratch work, to quickly erase and go on and modify. Whereas on the piece of paper, I gotta constantly slide the paper forward and write over what I already wrote over. That's not always an excellent presentation. But today, our mission is introduction and a not brief enough tour of the website and vectors in the plane and space. Generally, we're looking at the first two sections of the first chapter that we're covering. You've already brought one question about installing Mathematica and we will get to that. And basically, if you're experiencing some error block in the install that is probably not on your end it's probably on the end of delta college with license server and i do not control the license server i'm just admitting people as we go along here so i'll send a note to the person's managing the license server later and that should be cleared up sometime today i'll send a note to the class when that is totally clear. So this is what we're doing this semester. And in some ways, it's going to be shocking and unusual. In many ways, it's going to be very, very natural. So if you've read my website, been picking through it, I've given you a brief introduction to Calculus 3. And then you would have read that uh, there's no new calculus for you to learn here. You know, in the immortal words of Yoda, already know you that which you need. You've learned all the calculus, but you've learned it in two dimensions, which is fine if you're a hieroglyph on an ancient tomb, but it's not very practical if you're trying to follow the path of a baseball or a satellite or a missile or a bumblebee. It's not very practical if you're trying to scale a mountain or ski down a slope or work out the movements of a robotic arm. 
So our mission is not to teach a new calculus here. Our mission is to take the calculus you learn and bring it into three-dimensional practical space. And for that reason, I'm gonna give you a very brief tour of the website just to orient you. I respect the fact that you've probably already looked at this. So I'll try to make this as brief as possible, but there are still some things I'd like to draw your attention to. So I'm gonna share a screen. And by the way, anytime you want to pipe in, interrupt, you can do that in the chat. You can do that audio. And if I'm not paying attention to the chat or audio, you just say, hey, Dave, can I ask a question? I am not a terribly formal person. Dave or David is fine. If that is not comfortable for you, then you're welcome to say Mr. Redmond or Professor Redmond. But any way you like it, if we were face to face, we would be quickly informal and direct as well. So I'm just going to go to my website. And you have the address of this website, but basically websites delta.edu. BD Redmond. Bring it in here. Uh, this is the base of my website, but under semesters. Courses I'm teaching this semester. Math 261 is the course we're working on. And I do apologize for being deliberate or slow today, but yeah, orienting everybody in the online space, we're just gonna be very careful doing the orientations here. So this is our homepage and you will find everything you need for this class or any other class I teach on our website. And you can go back to my welcome page, contact information if you needed contact information, where I have office hours, email, website, and phone. I am kind of back in my office now, and some people are back in your office, but I'm generally on campus Tuesdays and Thursdays only. Now, there'll be some exceptions. So always the quickest way to reach me is by email. There's an email link right there. So back to the website. If you're interested in the courses I teach, you can look at the different semesters. You can look at courses I'm teaching this semester, next semester, other semesters unassigned, but you're primarily interested in Math 261. Uh, some fun things under mathematics, but you know, not a lot there because I'm retooling some things. Now you're in the fall of 2021 semester, you're in Math 261, you have access to our syllabus and our resources page. So I'm gonna give you a brief tour of those two. Notice on our homepage is just a very quick grounding of where you are in this class. So our class sessions are conducted remotely by Zoom meeting. And all you need to do is click on these links and you'll join the Zoom meeting. Because I respect that some of you are not gonna be always available every day, we designed this course so that these sessions would be automatically recorded and I will post these sessions to my YouTube channel afterwards. And there will be links on the weekly pages to each week's sessions, or you can see all the sessions by going to my YouTube channel later. Uh, I have some content turned on right there right now, but semester's just getting started. Office hours, and, and you're perfectly welcome to catch the recording and keep up with the class in that way. I have had students do that in all kinds of formats. I only gave you a gentle warning in a recent email that you, this will not be like, you know, the Outer Banks. You will not binge watch this show and succeed. So you do need to keep up, I would say, with the lectures daily as they happen, even trying to catch up to two lectures on the weekend too much material to process. Office hours are in person or by online Zoom meeting, and you can click these links at these times to join those Zoom meetings. Uh, you're welcome to visit on campus if you like. Uh, generally, just by the way things happen in this crazy pandemic time, all my classes are in the Tuesday and Thursday range. So I know you might wanna contact me outside Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. So you can always contact me by appointment. Just say, Dave, can I talk to you Monday at two? 
on a Zoom meeting. And I will say yes or no, I'm in another meeting, but we'll find some time. Okay, next space. How do you submit assignments when you have assignments in this class? We have a little Dropbox folder right here. And I will share the whole screen right now. So you can see that Dropbox folder in operation. Now you're looking at my whole screen. And another reason I have the iPad set up on my side here is so I can see what you see. But this Dropbox folder is just a place where you can click and upload a file. And you add a file. You can take a file from your computer. Uh, say I don't have any exciting files here, but where should I go? Let's say fall, let's say 261, let's say images, let's say parallel a pipehead. Oh, there's an interesting image. So I'm gonna open that up. And the Dropbox feature takes that file. I enter my name. I enter my email address and then I upload. And this is good for you and it's good for me. Uh, you, as you see on the screen, get a confirmation that you did upload something. I get an email that you did upload something. It's time stamped, so there's no issue about when did you hand it in, when did you not hand it in. And then I process that and return it to you. Now you're going to get used to the homework flow in here. It's not burdensome, but during this pandemic time, you've probably learned to prepare documents for presentation in a different way than you might in the classroom. So there are some comments later in my syllabus about preparing documents. Basically, the short story is I need one PDF file, neatly organized, pages numbered, name on pages. And that's going to help you and help me turn papers around very quickly. OK, but we can. Anything here we can re-demonstrate if you have any other questions. So Math 261, Analytic Geometry and Calculus 3. I'm gonna go back to sharing just that window so things are not so tight. And uh, this is the other curious thing about Calculus 3. If you read this little presentation right here, you actually learned calculus backwards. And if you were wondering why it was so hard, Maybe it's because you learned it backwards. Now, that's historically backwards, of course. People, Newton, Leibniz, Bernoulli, many, many excellent people were trying to solve physical problems and physical problems naturally in three dimensions. And the calculus, or what they called the calculus of the infinitesimals, was extremely effective in making some very cool predictions. But then, of course, naturally people said, are you sure about that? Is, is that really the way it is? And there were problems to work out, you know, exactly what did they mean by infinitesimal and limit and approaching. And those are all the things that you probably started with. So people went backwards, filled in all the details so that it was rock solid. And now you've learned it from the details forward. Now there's good news about that too, because you learned it from the building blocks, the basic building blocks, and you've advanced. But the kind of the sorry news about that is that you often are asking like, why limit? Why difference quotient? Why is this definition? Why do we do it this way? So in a way, now you can get the full picture in calculus three and vector calculus, multivariable calculus, you'll get a lot more answers about why you're doing it. But you have all the calculus you need to know. Now, here's our organization for the 16 calendar weeks of the course. I say 16 calendar weeks because we have two half weeks in here from the Thanksgiving break in week 13 and the Labor Day break in week two. So one week from today, of course, there will be no class session and no recording. But 
you see our pace for the course this semester, generally a couple of chapters we're going to look at, and then we're going to spend some time reviewing and doing our first exam. A couple more sections we're looking at, chapters four and five, and we're going to review and look at our second exam. And then our last chapter in this book is chapter six. We're going to review and take our third exam. There is no such thing as a final or cumulative exam in this class. I just have the course cut into three pieces and the exams cover just those pieces. I'll talk a great deal more about exams later, but there's not one in the immediate horizon. So I'm not going to be too concerned about it today. But of course, you're welcome to ask anything you like. Let's, before we go to week one, let's look at just the resources page, brief tour. Resources page is meant to answer this question. You know, I'm going to post a lot of handouts. I'm going to post videos and post things like that. And you're going to forget maybe, or I'm going to forget, what week did he post that video about the parallelogram law? And so on this resources page, it's just a catch-all to collect all the things that we've done, an outline of the course. a list of all your assignments, assessments, homeworks, exams. And you see your first couple of homeworks are posted here. We'll post them as we go. And a link, of course, to the homeworks folder. Uh, any handouts I pass out. And through the semester, I'll pass out a good deal of handouts. But here, they're just organized in total so that you can go back and find any particular thing you're looking for, like isometric graph paper. <laughs> Generally, what I'm doing is sending you to files that are on a Google Drive. So uh, I'm usually not doing this live in class because my connection's not gonna be super fast. So I'll generally show you things that are on my computer without going over to a Google Drive. But this is uh, just some graph paper, some isometric paper to help you draw things in three dimensions if you like to use this kind of grid. So if you want to investigate other graph paper, this, you're directed to a Google Drive where I've got all kinds of different graph papers that you can download and investigate. And this is generally how I'm gonna provide you with a lot of documents by linking you to a folder in a Google Drive that contains the documents or linking you directly to the document. Okay, same thing with formula sheets we'll collect. Uh, in some classes, in some math classes even, the formulas are spare and it's the concepts you're learning. So formula sheets aren't very populated. In this class, we're gonna look into several different contexts and formulas. And so instead of saying, Oh, I got my formula sheet, you got your formula sheet, whatever. I've collected the formulas we're going to use in a couple of batches. And so everybody's got the same thing. Uh, when we talk about exams, and we'll talk about exams on another day, I've provided lots of questions and answers. These are practice problems I've collected over many years with solutions. And they are zipped up in folders generally by topic here. So we can investigate one of those later. Some basic calculus facts and then some other topics by topic that we're gonna look at. Okay, so back to resources, video. All the videos I'll present here, including the class session videos by day, a uh, link to the playlist at the YouTube channel. Sometimes I'm gonna post videos of recommended problems that I've asked you to do, but this is really by request. I, I want you to drive the things I post and slowly I'll add things over time, right? But I'm not gonna work up a batch of 10 or 20 videos that you have no interest in. So you make the request, you bring the question, I'll make the video or write up a solution for you. So some recommended problems, I've cleaned these out to see what you're going to ask. And then we'll build resources for other people and for future classes. Uh, here's some basic videos on topics. 
that people ask over time, some very famous or interesting topics I've kept on the board. But if you want to ask a question in general, not particularly about a problem, maybe we'll create a little video about a topic here. Generally, these videos are in the range of two to three minutes because I want to get you stuff very quickly. Some of them are very dated and that's okay because I've been collecting them over a long time. Once in a while, I might get into the 10 minute or 15 minute video depending on the topic. Okay, resources, technology. This is where I'm gonna collect lots of things I want you to share and do. And this starts to touch on the Mathematica questions you asked. Uh, Desmos is not something to shake a stick at either. Desmos is really quite effective, but not as awesome in three dimensions. So there's lots of interesting things I can show you in Desmos. And this relates to a problem I might show you later, maybe in a day or two. You can construct a lot of good things with Desmos. I've even seen people force Desmos to work up three-dimensional images, but that's working a little bit too hard. You wanna have dedicated software for that. And so, there's a very common computer algebra system called Mathematica. And some of you have been working on downloading that. I appreciate that. And I'll investigate the error you had. But this <coughs> PDF document right here will give you the instructions for downloading and installing Mathematica. So I'll briefly address the error some of you are having. Uh, this is a product of Wolfram Research. It's a very a forward thinking company. It's a computer algebra system. It does a lot of sophisticated mathematics for you, more than you and I likely will ever use. But then again, your calculator probably does more than you'll ever use. Mathematica will just do it faster in color and more effectively so we can look at some live demonstrations. Mathematica is not the only product out there. In your careers in engineering or other sciences, you might use other products. The two leading products are really Mathematica and MATLAB. And uh, MATLAB is very similar, and we could demonstrate things in MATLAB, but I don't want to overburden you on the learning curve. So I'm going to use a Mathematica. Generally, Mathematica is kind of lots of Mathematical departments favor that. MATLAB, lots of engineering type departments favor that. Any reputable school you go to would have a site license for either of those products or maybe both. We have a site license for Mathematica, so you don't have to purchase it, which would be, you know, professional edition, set you back a little bit. But you do have to download and install it. Download is kind of large. Uh, you know, could take you an hour, could take you more, could take you less, depending on your connection. But you visit this address, you log in with your Delta College username and password, you download this file, and you unzip and install it. That much should be totally on your device, should not be an issue if you're installing an ordinary computer. I'll talk about Chromebooks in a second. After you install it, you have to activate it or you have to tell your machine where to get the okay to launch it. We have a hundred seat license at Delta College, which means a hundred people could use it at once. And the hundred and first person will be told that the site is busy. We would never get to 100 concurrent users just by nature of time and things like that. So you should always be on but you have to once tell your computer where to authenticate. So after you install, you'll be asked to activate copy of your license. And all you do in that dialog window is choose other ways to activate, connect to a network license server. And the license server is called licenseserver.delta.edu. Then you click activate. And you should only have to do this once, and you should have to do nothing else than this. If you get a message like you're not reaching license server or anything like that, you know, take a screenshot of it, copy it down, let me see it. 
it probably means that this license server in the back room at Delta has to be rebooted. Those of you on Chromebooks, I encourage you to check out Wolfram Online, Mathematica Online, and maybe I'll provide some links to you for this. Basically, that is running the software in a browser back and forth on their cloud. Uh, it is completely effective. It works on Chromebooks, but you might need to subscribe as a student at $9 a month. Before you pay any money, talk to me so I can send you the link to where you can get the cheaper rate, which is $9 a month. I invite you to install this on a regular computer if you can. You don't have to have it in front of you every day. You're welcome to use it on a Chromebook. But if you have a regular computer too, you can install it on and work with as you need it. That should be sufficient. OK, we'll cover questions about Mathematica as they come up. So what I have here, very fancy tool, very decent learning curve. So what I've done is prepare Mathematica documents for you to cover many interesting topics that will go along the way. So you would, if you want to learn about basic graphing and Mathematica, click this basic graphing notebook and you'll go to a Google Drive again and you can look up this basic graphing notebook. And since the browser doesn't know what to do with that notebook, I guess I'm not gonna let it spin and find that out. You basically would download this basic graphing notebook to your desktop. And then if you have Mathematica ready to go, Mathematica could open that. Uh, we'll give another demonstration of Mathematica later, but for time, we'll delay that for one session. Uh, if you were using Wolfram Online, Mathematica Online, I'd have to link you to notebook. You can't necessarily download and install a notebook. But Inside those notebooks, I'm not making you learn things from scratch, although Mathematica has excellent documentation. I'm giving you commands and setups so you can see some of the basic things it does. So do not be intimidated at all by some device like a Mathematica or a MATLAB. You just learn it one piece at a time and you slowly get more and more proficient at it but it's not something you're gonna know everything about in your lifetime, not even in one semester. Okay, that's the resources page. Let's look quickly at the syllabus. So our overly brief tour is, overly long tour is not too bad, but uh, I'll let you read this at your leisure. It describes our course. It describes our textbook, which is an interesting textbook. It's available online for free. You can consume it online, and I often consume it online. But if you want to own a copy, you can purchase a copy at one of these locations, uh, very in the order of twenty-five to forty dollars, depending on the format you use. So I like the logic and ethos of the OpenStax organization. Sometimes I, I maybe I complained a little bit too much in the email that this book could have been proofread a little bit better. It certainly could have, but there's certainly no lack of other calculus books that you can investigate and put on your shelf for $10 by picking an old edition. Here you can use this book for free if you're online, or you can download a PDF for free if you're not always online, or my favorite way is just by ordering a copy of the book, which looks something like that. Uh, that just flashed by on my document camera situation. So you can, uh, you can have any of my views available to you right now, the webpage document camera. Uh, no problem. I know some of you are in that situation that you have conflicting schedules. So whatever you can do or whatever I can do to help, uh, it's not a problem. I uh, just keep recording. Here's the link to Desmos. This is a very cool program. Uh, you can create an account at Desmos for no charge. And one of the reasons you might want to do that is because if you're fiddling, trying to work out some calculation, and you could just save it on your Desmos and send me a link to it and say, oh, Dave, can you help me with this? I don't see why this isn't working. So Desmos is really 
quite powerful. It's just focused on calculation graphing two dimensions. Mathematica, I'll talk more about later. When you're scanning and delivering PDF files to me, uh, I'd like you to use some ordinary device like Apple Notes, Adobe Scan. Just compile your documents into one object for me to consume and get back to you as fast as possible. I'll help you develop your skills in preparing documents for me as we go along. But basically, you know, try to focus on submitting a report. Uh, you can use a graphing calculator. You can use any graphing calculator you like. Um, I like the TI-89. So if I do demonstrations with a graphing calculator, it'll be TI-89 or Desmos or Mathematica. Uh, how do we measure attendance in this course? As I know people have to come and go sometimes. Basically, we've learned to measure attendance right now by on-time completion of assessments. So there is no requirement that you need to be here in these two hours. Just that you have to keep up appropriately. And I'm going to measure you keeping up by completing the homework and exams. Official court states, we note that we do not meet on Tuesday, September 7 or Thursday, November 25. But if you want to know all the ins and outs about course dates, start in, refunds, drop dates, you can contact the registrar's office. This is me right here, David Redmond. This is where to find me on campus. I've already given you links to office hours when I'm on campus in person or when I'm on campus in Zoom. If you need an extra appointment, no problem. Just send me a note and we'll work out an arrangement. As I said before, email is the fastest way to contact me. Uh, if you had to mail me something well, someday, I can't think of why right now, but it did happen running class in the pandemic, there is a mailing address that would get to me. These are my expectations of you in this class. So you can read these and see how we're gonna do things. Uh, you know, I anticipate that you're gonna submit 35 to 40 homework problems over the semester. That's just a tiny, tiny number. Uh, you know, maybe one on Thursdays, two on Tuesdays over the weekend. Those things are meant for me to help you learn how to prepare to present. You really need to do many, many more problems. And so I'll show you where I have the recommended exercises for you to do, not to hand in, but to do. So information about our class sessions, office hours, homework that I just shared. Uh, you learn by doing, you learn by working together. I have no problem. If you are comparing solutions and checking each other's work on homework, I think you need to work together sometimes just to do a little safety checks. And homework is a very safe and simple place to do that. Uh, when we come down to the exams, there'll be different rules and you'll be preparing the exams strictly by yourself. We'll talk more about exams later, but that's not immediately on our horizon. So just a little bit of tips to help you organize your homework. This is what I want you to do. Uh, I have an old iPhone SE first generation, so I tend to use Apple Notes to create PDFs quickly from pictures, Microsoft Lens, Adobe Scan, those are also things that can help you. Uh, you need to use both Desmos and Mathematica in this course. At various times, you wanna be able to draw things by hand too, but some of the things we're gonna do are gonna be a little bit challenging to draw by hand. You should still develop your skills. So you want to use different tools to help you prepare things. Uh, assignments and deadlines. Uh, that's another thing that's strange to manage in this pandemic time. But uh, basically, so that we don't have multiple colliding times, I just put all deadlines 11.59 p.m on the date specified. So your first homework assignment is due Thursday. It's due Thursday at 11.59 p.m. to our assignments folder. So just, I want you to get used to that. I don't want you to stay up till midnight. You can hand it in any time you want, but I just create one time so that people 
don't have to worry about different days, different times. Hand in assignments, homework on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then later we'll see that we'll hand in uh, exams on Saturday night. Uh, exams, you sh I expect you're gonna have a week to work on a particular exam, but again, we'll talk about exams later. Uh, this is how your grade is gonna be constructed. We're nearing the end of our tour. Thank you for being patient. Uh, you got three exams. They represent 25% of your grade each. And then you have the total of your homework exercises and the total percentage there, that will represent 25% of your grade. So I will give you a specific weekly printouts telling you what your grade is. So you'll see how this is calculated, but you take 25% of each exam or 25.25 times each exam percentage, 0.25 times your homework percentage, add these four things together at the end and uh, just make it simple. Let's round up to the next whole percentage. And that is your letter grade as described here. So if your percentage after the semester is over is, you know, like 81.2, and that becomes 82%, and your grade would be B. Again, you can throw in any questions you like about this, but uh, it's kind of just particular legal stuff, and you'll get used to our system as we go along. I'll help you. So resources syllabus, and then here are the 16 weeks. The outline for the whole course is filled in. I haven't filled in all the assignments, handouts, things like that in the order I want them. But the first couple of weeks, I have things prepared for you. So here's a typical week one. Again, organized outline assessments, handouts, video technology. But now this is about the things we're going to do in week one. Kind of oversharing in my outline at the beginning here. I don't think I'm always going to give you this much detail in an outline, but I'm just kind of like starting out by oversharing and testing some things out. So these are the three sections we'll discuss this week. We'll get into 2 1 and 2 2 today. Assessments. These are your homework exercises. This is where you'll submit them, the assignments folder. But just to give you an idea, you know, I look through the problems in the book. Sometimes I alter them, sometimes I correct typos, but these are not the exact same problems in the book, but I gave you the problem in the book that I referenced. It might be very much like it and I just corrected a typo. Or it might be very much like it, and I added a picture that I want you to create. But you click on the homework exercise. Again, you'll be taken by link to a file in a Google Drive, and you could print this out and write on it, and then PDF it back to me when you're done with a couple pages with pictures as you need. But here is your first homework problem, which is due on Thursday by 11.59 p.m. So just a little bit of talk about, here's a vector, draw me a nice graph, just helping you ease into the homework. So I refer to problems in the book all the time, but the homework problems I'll present for you as links so that we make sure everybody's got the same problem, no typos, no different versions of the book, stuff like that, because sometimes books can be found in different versions, even this book. So there's your homework. No homework due today, of course. Uh, Thursday, one problem. No homework due, of course, on Tuesday. We have no class session. And then on Thursday next, you'll hand in a couple homework problems. And that's probably going to be our habit. Hand in one homework problem on Thursday, hand in two on Tuesday or after a holiday. Okay, exams, we'll talk about later. Here's some basic handouts for you. I will copy these class notes that we're writing, or we'll start to write someday. I will copy them, scan them, and post them here in case you want to 
check out something we wrote or in case you want to follow along, you're welcome to take your own notes. Uh, some graph paper, as I've shown you, formula sheets. Here's the first formula sheet. Here's some handouts about lines, planes, and distance. And even in such simple topic like line or plane or distance, there are things that you could learn and there are things I could show you to be more effective at. Uh, class videos, again, will be posted here, or you can go to the class videos site on my YouTube channel, but right now there's nothing in that playlist, so we'll have things posted later today. Recommended problems, that's just another YouTube playlist. Okay, I may, I, I may not have turned on the playlist. And then here's some basic topics. Uh, that should take you straight to the video where you see my happy face again. The Cauchy Swartz inequality. And that's a very important topic. Cauchy Swartz inequality, we'll talk about that maybe tomorrow or a next session, possibly Thursday. Uh, next Thursday. Okay. Then for technology, I just want you to get. Mathematic installed and functional on your machine in whatever form you're going to use it. So I just gave you a very basic notebook with a little bit of graphing hints in it. And you can investigate that at your leisure. Again, if you have trouble installing Mathematica, I will check on our end to make sure everything is functional. And I will post a note to the group when everything has been corrected. Okay, that is uh, basically the speech. Now, recommended problems I didn't highlight, but notice I don't go through the book and let's say, let's go through one through 100 odd, right? Now I picked out exercises that I thought were key exercises here. And then upon request or once in a while, I might post an answer to the exercise like, oh, this is how I did number 55. It doesn't mean that you have to do it that way, but I'm trying to model good presentation for you. So here's an exercise 55 and section 2.1 that I wanted to show you how to do. This is actually an interesting, useful exercise. You may have encountered such things in physics classes, but it's a good way for you to orient yourself in the overlap and the cooperation between physics and mathematics. So remember I said, you know, two, three, four homework problems a week, that doesn't cut it. That's not gonna get you anywhere. Your homework problems that you're gonna to hand to me are ways for me to help you learn how to present properly and effectively. I think you need to practice a lot of problems, but I'd be foolish if I said you needed to do every problem in a section. So start with the recommended exercises. Each section, I give you a list of recommended exercises. If you're working on the exercises and you see one that you're not sure about, like number 95, you send me a note, I post a video or solution. Uh, this book organizes itself by counting the exercises in each chapter from one to the end. So when you see the section two start at exercise 63, that's because it started numbering the exercises in section two around 63. So this book numbers exercises by chapter and not by section. So you are teared into these recommended exercises. Let me know what you have a question about. I'll post solutions, hints, videos as you go along. Many of them are odd numbered. Okay, you have answer in the back of the book often but sometimes the answer is not enough. You know, like, okay, I know what the answer is, but that doesn't help me. I didn't get that answer. Uh, how do I know the book didn't make an error? How do I know where my error is if I made an error? That's why you can ask me and I'll present solutions to you. Okay, so that is kind of the not brief enough tour of our website. <laughs> And I seriously apologize for that, but we got to orient ourselves somehow. I don't want to force you to ask questions either, but if you have any question about this, and I don't mind whatever question you ask, typing or miking, but if you have any questions about that, 
you can throw that in the chat or audio it into our recording. I'm going to go back to my paper presently, but you know, just poke around my website, see how things are organized, get used to it. My goal was to present things very, very simply that you could access it on any device. And then you get quickly directed to what you need. I'm not trying to create an entertainment site right here. Okay. Then I think we're going to get started. Uh, I also know that even in a two hour session, as we sit at home on our sofas or elsewhere, you cannot concentrate for two hours. So I always take a break at the top of the hour. Maybe we'll talk a few words about math before we take a break at the top of the hour. Take a break for five minutes and then move on. So I am seriously sorry for talking at you this way. But this is our presentation mode in this semester. So I'm going to stop the screen share, stop that window share, and let's go back to my paper. So installing Mathematica questions, I will check on our license server after class. I don't want to write down the wrong address. And I'll post a note to the group. After I verify that it's working. And if you want to throw up any other question in here, I'll write down questions and answers as we go along. Let's talk about vectors in the plane and in space. And I have a feeling you've used vectors before in some context, right? So again, I'm not doing this to bore you and I'm not doing it because you don't necessarily know how to consume what's in the book, but I am presenting things so that we all kind of speak the same language. So that we're all kind of organized in the same way. So the book gives a nice presentation. I'm gonna give just a brief presentation here of the first two sections in the book. And I think we should be able to cover pretty much all of that in the time that's allotted to us today. If we're not completely finished talking about section 2.2, maybe I'll bring you some examples or other things on Thursday. But I want us all to be using the same vocabulary and I want us all to be thinking about the same things. So when I say vector, and people describe vectors in a variety of ways. So you might hear people say vector, a directed line segment. And that's a fine definition. Or you might say vector has length and direction. And that's also an accurate statement. Uh, my favorite is vector. It is a product. Of its length and direction. So what do I mean by these things? A directed line segment, it has length and direction. It's a product of length and direction. Essentially, what I'm trying to communicate to you is a vector is an animal that has two qualities. 
it's a very simple animal. You're an animal that has many qualities, you know, height, weight, hair color, age, many, many things describe you. Only two things describe a vector, and that is its length and its direction. So I commonly call a vector like this. And that vector that I just put on the paper has a fixed finite length. And the arrowhead I put at the end is meant to indicate its direction. Vectors can start and stop anywhere. So if I told you this vector started at a point named P and it ended at a point named Q, this would be the vector from P to Q. And P and Q and the order I present them in here must be important because they indicate a direction. If I wanted the vector from Q to P, I think I would put the arrowhead at the other end and I'd be going exactly the opposite way, right? So when people give you the order, initial point, terminal point, it's important that you follow that order. Uh, some people use the initial point, the terminal point to name the vector. So they call this, again, the vector from P to Q, and they use P and Q in this order to mean from P to Q. Some people want to simplify that naming, and so they might simply name it with a letter, and it doesn't have to be lowercase or uppercase, but not uncommon for people to use a letter V for a vector, or V or U or W, you could use any letter you please to be a vector. So this vector right here, whether I write V or whether I write PQ, I mean exactly the same thing. Okay, good. Now, next step. Notice whenever I name a vector, I do put an arrow hat on top of it. And I think that's a habit you need to have. Different people name vectors with different things. Sometimes people name vectors with little caps like that. We're not gonna do that. Sometimes in the book, the book names a vector by making it boldface. Of course, we're not gonna do that because that just uses up ink and it takes a long time to draw. So get in the habit of putting an arrow hat, an arrow above the vectors that you name. Just a good practice so people know Oh, she's talking about a vector. He's talking about a vector. Okay, now let's talk about the qualities of this vector right here. Uh, you know, I haven't told you whether this vector is on the paper or in space. Are P and Q points on the plane or points in space? You could say they're points in the plane because I drew them on a sheet of paper, but I often draw three-dimensional things on a sheet of paper, right? So vectors can be two-dimensional, in two-dimensional space, in three-dimensional space, in nine-dimensional space. And we'll show you how to present them in each case. We're going to be focusing on two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space. And I'll show you how to construct vectors at that time. Now, if I need to communicate direction and length, I have to have some way of measuring those. And length might not be too bad. We could take a ruler to this and find out how long it is. Let's assume for the moment that this is truly a two-dimensional vector on my plane, on my sheet of paper. But direction's kind of odd because everybody has different ways of writing directions, right? You know, if you're navigating a boat, you say from the north, you know, heading. If you're drawing things in the plane, you often say from the positive horizontal axis. But you could talk about angle from the vertical, angle from the horizontal. You could talk about angle from anywhere. But we have to have an agreement about what we're going to use for the word direction. And we have to have an agreement about what we're going to use for the word length. So before we go to our break, Let's just do a quick length calculation. I'll assume in this example 
that I'm talking about two dimensional points, P and Q. And I'll let P be the point uh, one, three. And I'll let Q be the point two and minus seven. Now notice when I do that, that that now bears no resemblance to the point I put here. Is the Y value of Q minus seven in my picture? Is the X value of P one in my picture? Well, you don't know because I haven't given you any coordinate system. But usually you don't think of minus seven as going up. Right? So now you've got to suspend your disbelief, but without a coordinate system, you don't know exactly what I'm referring to. But you can tell me how to travel from P to Q. By traveling from P to Q, I am at position one in the first slot, and I'm at position two in the second slot. So to go from P to Q, I will have to take one step in the first slot plus one, I won't write the plus. In the second coordinate, the second slot, I'm at uh, position three, go ahead. I can't see, the, you need to shift the paper up, thank you. Very good, yeah, now, since I've taken a few weeks off, you've taken a few weeks off, make sure you remind me when I don't advance the paper. Uh, how do I advance from position three to position minus seven? Well, actually, I have to go backwards 10 steps. So now I've described this vector from P to Q. I've told you how to get from P to Q in a sense. And you don't have to say that it's related to this picture. And if you want a better picture than this, I think we could draw it. Let's say that I set my coordinate axes here and go one step back and 10 steps down. It's quite a long vector. Well, everything is relative, right? Goes from that point to that point. Now you say, but but wait a minute. You said your starting place was at one three. Okay, then I'll set some markers on my axes and start at the point one three. Let me use a different color pen. And isn't it the point two and minus seven, which is right here? One, two, and there's the vector. Obviously, these two vectors seem to be doing different things. What did I do incorrectly here? I misinterpreted the vector one minus 10 with this blue arrow. I was supposed to go one unit to the right, take one step in the positive direction and 10 steps down. So that blue arrow should have rather been coming down like this. Okay, this is the bad side about using paper and not using a board. So this is the point P, this is the point Q, this is the vector from P to Q. But this vector, just by its drawing, you see it has exactly the same length and it's pointing in a parallel direction. It's pointing exactly the same way. I could call this vector P to Q also. Except I'd have to rename P at the origin and rename Q at one and minus 10. So I might give this vector here a generic name like V so that I don't confuse you as to where the position of P and Q are. And that's why people use single letters to draw vectors. So they're a little more flexible while where the vectors begin and end. Now you believe you have a very tight grip on the length of this, and you probably could define the direction as well. But we're gonna do that when we come back. Let's take a break. Uh, I got. 902 here, we say come back at 907. And 
I'll be more specific about this. I know this is a very slow introduction, but I'm about to hit you with potentially a new idea. So I want to be very careful in how I presented that, and I regret drawing that in error. When I take a break, I'm just going to mute my microphone, stretch my legs. You're welcome to do the same. I'll come back at 9.07, but I won't change the recording. I'll just let it roll.
Okay, welcome back. And we're about to do a very, very important naming convention to get everybody off on the right track. So we've made our little drawing right here. Uh, this is the very first thing that we pointed out that generally when people talk about vectors, if two vectors have the same length in the same direction, and both this blue and red vector, even by the poor quality of my drawing, appear to have the same length in the same direction, counting the grid points on my paper. Then some people call those vectors equal. Some people call those vectors equivalent, and you're gonna to have to tolerate both sets of people. I tend to call those two vectors equal, but I don't mean equal that they are the same. This one's red and this one's blue. I just mean that they have exactly the same effect. They both take one step to the right and 10 steps down. And where I locate them is up to me. So to combat that, when I'm referring to specific points, I often say from P to Q, if the location of that vector is important, and I want you to know the names of those points. But if I'm speaking generically, and that vector could be starting any place I please. And I usually use a letter like V and more often we'll use a single letter. But you already know how we're gonna figure out the length of that vector. Even if it's a tall, thin vector like that, you've got this concept called what? The Pythagorean theorem. And if someone hands you a vector, you can imagine in the horizontal direction, vertical direction, you have a triangle, with two little sides like that. And the sides could be length A and length B. And if you want to know the length of that vector, use the Pythagorean theorem, A squared plus B squared is C squared. Now in vector language, the length of a vector is denoted with double absolute value bars like this. That's literally called the length of V, or some people want to get fancy, call it the magnitude of V. You could use those words interchangeably. You can talk about the length of a cable, but sometimes if you're talking about the acceleration of a car or the force of the tension in a cable, you can't measure those things with a ruler, so you talk about their magnitudes. But I am allowing you to use those words interchangeably. Most people allow you to use those words interchangeably. Now, in this problem right here, I take one step over and 10 steps down. And so I can figure out what the length of that is, the square of the length by the Pythagorean theorem. One squared plus minus 10 squared. And the square of the length must be 101. So the length of that vector, V or PQ, either way you wanna name it, is the square root of 101. So a little more than 10 units long. That makes sense by my drawing. So we don't have any arguments about how to construct length. And notice just, I don't need a picture to do this either. If someone asks me for the length of PQ, I just say one squared plus 10 squared, square rooted, square root of 101. So length is not hard to construct. In fact, even in multiple dimensions, length is not hard to construct. But direction, then we gotta get everybody on the same page. And we gotta get everybody to agree to measure from the north or to measure from the horizon or to measure from the whatever on the paper, right? So one typical way to measure vector is, I advance my paper, to measure from the positive horizontal direction. So if you have a vector coming out like this, in V, you get out your protractor, and I'm not gonna pull out a protractor right here, and I measure this angle theta from the positive horizontal direction. And I could call theta the direction. Is the direction here 
30 degrees. Well, that's not sufficient, right? 30 degrees from what? 30 degrees from the horizontal. That's not sufficient. 30 degrees from the positive horizontal direction. Even that's not sufficient because maybe you and I disagree about what the positive horizontal direction is. If we were, say, on opposite sides of a street. So angle as direction is sometimes awkward. And if I go to three dimensions, even more awkward. But sometimes angle is extremely useful because I can specify this vector by using the length of the vector on this side and I could specify the length of this horizontal component by saying mag v cosine theta. And I could sponsor, specify the length of this vertical component by saying mag v sine theta. It's not that the angle theta has no value. It's just that we have to agree where theta is being measured from. All right, this a right here, mag v cos theta, this b right here, mag v sine theta. You understand where that comes from? The ratio of a to mag v is the cosine of theta. So if someone asked me what a is, that's why I say mag v, mag short for magnitude, mag v cos theta. Likewise, mag v sine theta for b. So using this angle and measuring this angle is not unimportant. It just requires us to make an extra agreement. But I have another idea. Or, well, I didn't come up with this idea. Many people came up with it long before me. So maybe I could specify direction not with an angle reference but with a pointer reference. It's the same way you say, where'd you put that Frisbee, Dave? And I'm likely to go to my garage and point to it. Oh, it's over there. It's over there. It's up there. It's on the shelf, right? You frequently indicate directions by pointing, don't you? So I got an interesting idea for you. And this is something you may or may not have encountered before. And that's why we're being so careful, even in two dimensions. What if we find direction by pointing? And that is right here. Let's take. Uh, a vector. Let's draw it in this grid, and I'll respect this grid. I'm taking one, two, three, four, five steps to the right, and I'm taking one, two, three steps up. So let's call this vector v. Five steps in the positive horizontal direction, and three steps in the positive vertical direction. Uh, notice my conventions when naming vectors, arrow hat on every vector I name, of course. And to distinguish vectors from points in the plane, like the point called 5,3, I will put a pointy bracket on the vector. This is not uncommon, and the book uses this convention. This pointy bracket says I'm referring to a vector, I'm not referring to a point. Now, in the end, you'll learn as we go along that referring to points and vectors are sometimes done simultaneously. Sometimes that causes confusion and sometimes that makes things easier. But use pointy brackets when you're describing vectors in any dimension. Right now we're still in two dimensions. Well, you and I know what the length of this vector is, right? Oh, some people use only single vertical bars to discuss length and that's okay. That's kind of reminiscent of absolute value. 
what's the absolute value of minus four? Well, it says the minus four is four units away from the origin. It's measuring a distance. I don't mind if you use just single bars. I have the habit of using double bars, and I think that's the way the book does it. Anyway, not hard to work out the length of this vector. Say five squared plus three squared. Notice even if one of these was negative, the square would make it positive. It's 25 plus nine is 34. So it's just shy of six. There's no harm. Here's another presentation style I want you to learn. There is no harm in telling me what the square root of 34 is. I mean, right now, I don't know more than it's just shy of six, right? Okay. I'll ask my friendly calculator. My friendly calculator says 5.83095189595, et cetera. Well, I don't have time for that. So I'll say 5.83. But never, you'll never convince me that the length of that vector is 5.83. It might be approximately 5.83. If you round something off, I don't mind. Just be honest and say it, that you're rounding things off. So first present exact answer, then present approximation, if you want to. But whenever you approximate, tell someone you're approximating so that they don't believe that it's exactly that value. But now let's just take the square root of 34. I can't really simplify it. And let's create a new vector. Let's take the vector v and divide each slot by that length. I haven't talked about dividing in vectors yet, but you can imagine what this might represent. I'm just shrinking the vector. I could write one over the square root of 34, outside here, and then multiply by the vector 5, 3. Pointy brackets. This operation that I'm doing is called scaling. It is not called multiplying. It's called scaling. Although I might commonly say I multiply by 1 over root 34, what I legally did was scale the vector. You understand that if I multiplied by 2, I might be creating a vector that's the same direction, but two times as long, right? That would be scaling by two. I could scale by minus one. I could scale by minus one half. Scaling changes the length of the vector, and it might change the direction of the vector. If I multiply by a negative number, I'll be turning the vector backwards. I'll be going in the opposite direction. But there I go again, I'm using that word, direction, direction, same direction, opposite direction, but I haven't said what direction is yet. This is the direction. Whenever you take a vector and divide it by its length, that is called the direction of the vector b. Now, at first, you're going to revolt against this because okay, no, direction is north, direction is northeast, direction is southwest, direction is 35 degrees, Dave. Say, no, 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 open your mind. Let's call this direction. Why should I call this direction? Well, let's look carefully at the vector five over root 34, three over root 34. You know, this red arrow right here, which is V, so I gotta re-highlight the red arrow. I'll re-emphasize it. This red arrow is 5.83 units long. In fact, I could literally measure that with my graph paper, right? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, not quite at six, 5.83 units long. 
because my ruler right now is the grid on my graph paper. So we believe we have a handle on the length, but let's look at the length of that vector. What is the length of V divided by mag V? Well, you know how to do that for any vector. Slap these big absolute value bars on it. Square the first slot. Square the second slot. Add them together and take the square root. Sorry, move paper up. When I do that, you have to keep track of the fractions, but I got 25 over 34. And I got nine over 34. And magically, although it's not magic, what's 25 over 34 plus nine over 34? What is 34 over 34? It is one, and the square root of one, of course, is one. This vector that I call V over mag V, this vector that I call the direction of vector V is naturally one unit long. And this is our pointer. I'm not gonna be able to do this super duper on this paper right here, but let me draw a vector five and root 34 that is exactly one unit long. That means one box. So it's gonna be a little bit shy of there. And it's gonna be doing what? Following the vector V. This vector right here is V over mag V. And most people commonly refer to that as the direction of the vector V. Now I'll show you several things that are cool about that. First cool thing is I spoke about direction and I did not have to reference an angle. So we're not gonna have any arguments about where are you measuring from Dave? Where's the protractor? Direction is pointing. I am pointing that direction. Second thing I want you to notice is this works in two dimensions, but it also works in three dimensions. Here's the pen pointing. Of course, the camera doesn't represent that very nicely, but the pen can point up, the pen can point down, the pen can point in multiple directions, right? I could illustrate that by trying to draw in three dimensions. Eventually, you gotta learn how to draw in three dimensions, right? A vector that comes out so much and goes over so much and goes up so much. So well, that's a vector that's pointing in a very specific direction. So here's a vector W in space, even though I haven't talked about three-dimensional vectors yet. But if I took two steps out in the positive X direction and four steps out in the positive Y direction, and then six steps up, the elevator in the positive z direction, then I could imagine a vector called 2, 4, 6. And what's cool about our notions of length and direction right now? Because if I asked you what length is of w, you'd have no hesitations. Length w equals what? Square two, square four, square six. Now you could do this quickly in your head, but don't make any errors. But there's no harm in writing it down. Square two, square four, square six. Usually I just square them. Take add and square root. So what I got, four, 16, 36. Four plus 16 is 20, plus 36 is 56. This is the square root of 56. Now that's a little more than seven. That's a little less than eight. Uh, if I wanted to simplify it, and I should, there's a perfect square called four inside there, right? 
four times 14. So this is two root 14. If I wanted to estimate it, I have no problem, as long as you tell me you're estimating it. But first give me the exact value. Now, what if I asked you for the direction of W? From now on, when someone asks you for the direction of the vector, I want you to respond with the vector divided by its length. And since I named the vector, and since I calculated the length, this is really no issue. Now, I could write one over 34 on the outside. I could write vector divided by two root 14 like this, although that looks kind of funny. All that I mean is that I'm dividing each slot by two root 14. And that produces a new vector. Now the twos cancel. I'll get one over root 14, two over root 14, and three over root 14. And that is itself another vector, but that vector is called the direction of W. It is the pointer that is pointing in the same direction as W. Does that sound like a cop out? Well, what's direction of W? Oh, it's the direction of this pointer. But it is a natural way to describe direction. Like I said, when someone asks you, Where's the calculator? You point, it's over there. You give them the exact direction to the calculator, right? You don't tell them, well, I want you to turn 10 degrees with your hand from the desk edge and then 30 degrees down. No, that's ridiculous. There's a time and place for that, but this is the simplest way to present direction. Notice direction is always one unit long. And if it's not, you or I have made an error. Let's test it out. Let's take W, excuse me, divided by mag W, and then mag that. Get used to the slang. Here's W over mag W right here. Let's square, 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 add square root. I'll do this one a little faster. Squaring each slot will give me one over 14, four over 14, and nine over 14. Magically, of course, it's not so magically. That is 14 over 14, and that's the square root of one, which is one. Direction is always one unit long, and you better check that when someone asks you for a direction. If you give someone a direction vector, and it's not one unit long, they're just gonna think you don't know what you're talking about. Always check your directions to make sure they're one unit long. But now here's the awesome, awesome value of defining direction like this. Let's go back to how I spoke about vectors at the very beginning. Remember, a vector is a directed line segment. A vector has length and direction. Here's the way sometimes Mathematicians or physicists like to say it. A vector is the product of its length and its direction. Let's look at W that way. A vector is the product of its length and direction. And all that means is if you take the length of W, excuse me, I moved the paper up. I gotta do several things or get used to doing several things. I always number these pages because like I said, we're gonna scan them and input them later for your reference. So I gotta keep numbering the pages and then I gotta advance them under the camera. But if you take what? the length and you multiply by what? The direction? Well, then what should you naturally get? 
Well, this is no surprise. Mag W is a number. It's a positive number. Now, if it's zero, then we got a different situation, but let's just talk about positive number. What happens if you take a number and multiply and you take the same number and you divide? Well, of course they just cancel out. So all you get is the original W. So in this sense, do you see that a vector is the product of its length and its direction? That's a very convenient way to think of it. Now, if you wanna see it in numbers, we know that the length of W was two root 14. And the direction of W after we finished calculating was one over root 14, two over root 14, three over root 14. And you can see that if you use this number to scale this vector, what happens? Well, the root 14s cancel and the two gets distributed inside here. You get two, four, six. And that is the original W, right? Now I'm gonna give you a time writing, time saving convention. Instead of writing one over root 14, two over root 14, three over root 14, sometimes that just is too much writing. I would have no problem if you wrote the direction of W as one over root 14 times one, two, three. But then know that this whole thing is the direction of W. One, two, three is not the direction of W because it's not one unit long. But that makes calculations sometimes a little bit easier. It makes writing easier. Two over root 14 times one over root 14. I'm sorry, two, two root 14 times one over root 14. You see the root 14s cancel. You just get two times one, two, three, which is two, four, six. Now I will come back and I will talk about angles, particularly next time, because angles do have a place in specifying direction. But let's talk about utility. Speaking of direction in this way, often has the greatest utility. You're probably really interested in what this angle is. You might be interested in this angle for the W. Well, the first question, of course, I'm gonna ask you is which angle? Angle from the x-axis, angle from the y-axis, angle from the z-axis. Do you need all three of those to correctly point in the direction of W? Do you need two out of three of those to correctly point in the direction of W? Well, maybe I'll let you think about that. But that's the problem with angles. You know, like, seems like you've got to specify a lot of information. Still, you do like to use angles to describe things in two and three dimensions. But this is much more effective, called the direction of W. Do you understand why it's more effective, even though we're not going to do this? What if I gave you this vector? Uh, let's call it the vector Z. And let's say the vector Z is minus one, zero, four, seven. Now we're not gonna use four dimensional vectors in this class. Z with a little strike through it. But do you understand that even though you don't normally operate in four dimensions, you clearly know the length of this vector. What is it? One plus zero plus 16 plus 49. Square rooted. Now that's 66. I hope it's 66, 50, 16, yes. And uh, do I got any simplifying to go down here? Nope, can't simplify that, no perfect squares in that. 66 is a little more than eight square rooted. Well, okay, I'm not gonna say zero, zero, zero. You use your calculator, but it's a little more than eight. Oh, by the way, when you approximate something, approximate it to the accuracy specified. So I'm not specifying any accuracy here. It's just a little more than eight. And what about the direction of Z? No whining that you've never been to the fourth dimension. All you do is take one over root 66 and scale the vector. 
Now you and I don't operate in the fourth dimension, but if we had any four dimensional visitors, they would understand exactly what we're writing. One over root 66, zero, four over root 66, and seven over root 66. This is awesome, awesome utility. I can speak about length and direction in any dimension. Now, you know, the physicists are kind of awkward. You know, some days the physicists think there's four dimensions and time is a dimension, but we can't go backwards and forwards and, you know, go watch Interstellar. Awesome movie. But uh, seven dimensions. Some physicists say 13 or 17 dimensions. You know, I'm going to let them get their act together. Mathematicians, we don't care. There are as many dimensions as we want. In fact, there's nothing wrong with having infinitely many dimensions. I'll let you have as many dimensions as you want, but I just specified length and direction for any dimension in any universe you wanna operate in. That's the utility of describing direction like this and length like this. Now, I also, when you go to your other math classes someday, and I, this would be very, very far in advance, maybe if you were interested in being a math major, you might discuss length or direction in different contexts. But for all your practical purposes, you can define length and direction like this. You can even define angles in multiple dimensions. And we can do that later right? But in this class, we're going to hang out specifically in three dimensions. But I just want you to know, this is a cool way to describe length and direction, because it even works in higher dimensions. Okay, we are hitting the highlights. Uh, maybe I should spell that word out. So I'm not saying everything that the book's saying right here. I'm just talking about the highlights. I need you to read the book. I need you to work at the problems because people use lots of other language when they specify vectors. Let's go back to another vector, let's say in three dimensions. Let's say, let's give it another name. Eventually you run out of letters to name vectors, right? So you usually end up reusing letters over and over and over again. So let's say a vector in three dimensions called uh, minus one, four, minus two. And by the way, whenever you meet a vector, the very first things you do often, not always, are write down its length and direction, right? But not hard to do. One plus 16 plus four is 21. So this vector is 21 units long, rooted, 21 root units long. And what's the direction of this vector? Again, you don't sweat that. You just say, for short, one over root 21, negative one, four, negative two. Now that is a shorthand. I'm allowing you to write that scalar. Oh, by the way, this operation is called scalene. So this number right here is called a scalar. A scalar is one who scales. If you climb a, a mountain, you are scaling the mountain. You are a scalar of the mountain. <coughs> so uh, go watch the movie Free Solo. You can find that on Netflix. Very cool movie about a person who scales mountains. Okay, so just like whenever the public safety officer pulls you over, says, David, may I see your license and registration? Whenever someone hands you a vector, you say, vector, may I see your length and direction? 
Of course, the vector will not talk back to you or will not even respond to you at all. So you have to write down its length and direction. So just keep that in your mind. That's the very first thing you want to know about any vector, its length and its direction, right? But I want to show you other ways to write this vector. So I could imagine this vector and try to draw a really careful picture. But always drawing pictures is kind of fraught with danger. Well, we'll get better at drawing pictures as we go along. But let me see if I could draw a fair picture of this. Let's say I want to go back one unit on the x-axis. So I call this x, y, and z axes. I have some conventions here. The y and z are kind of in the plane of the paper, and the x-axis is like coming out of the paper at you. But that's hard to draw, so I draw it on the diagonal and pretend it was coming out of the paper. So first I'll go back one unit, and then I'll go over four units and then I'll go down two units. And then I'll draw the vector from the origin to that point. Now that seems like I just drew an arrow on a piece of paper going in another direction, but sometimes you can help yourself by orienting yourself, make yourself a little box that shows you how you're going in the x, y, and z directions. And if I brought this box over to here, this is the part where my drawing skill is going to fail. Down two units there. You kind of visualize the box. Here's a cardboard box on your doorstep, just arrived from Amazon. And in this box from Amazon, they shipped you this is crummy vector, just one long, thin, green stick. Okay, why did they waste that cardboard? What is my carbon footprint just done to me? You know, this is why the planet is melting, because you're ordering vectors from Amazon at random. Now, I'm just trying to make a point with humor right here. By drawing this box, by labeling this minus one, by labeling this four, by labeling this minus two, it helps you see that vector in perspective, right? And you can imagine the length of that vector being the square root of 21. The square root of 21, I'm not always interested in approximating things, but let's give it a shot. Oh, 4.58 to the nearest hundredth. Sorry, I just poked you in the eye. Yeah, if this box is four units long, not too thick, not too deep, that could be 4.6 units, that vector right there. I believe that. Here's the direction vector. Each one of these multiply there. That direction vector is pointing the same direction and it's approximately that long. Now, that long approximately in my drawing, but it's gotta be exactly one unit long in reality, which it is. So there's the vector that just arrived from Amazon. But sometimes instead of this pointy bracket notation, you'll see people specify vectors in this notation. They think of the X, Y, and Z axis as having natural pointers. And the natural pointers are exactly one unit long. So I'm just trying to wrap up some ideas before we finish today. What if I specified for the X, Y, and Z direction, a natural pointer in the X direction called I? One unit step on the x direction, no step in the y direction, no step in the z direction. What if on the j on the y axis, I specified a pointer called j? These are the traditional letters i, j, 
And in the z-axis, the traditional letter is K. So these are like reference vectors. In fact, literally like a frame of reference. And the frame of reference we use is the right-hand rule. So if I point my pointer finger in the X direction and my middle finger in the Y direction, of course, I'm gonna hurt myself, then my thumb is supposed to be pointing up in the Z direction. You use your right hand to specify X, Y, and Z directions. That's called the right hand rule. So this I, J and K is what? A natural frame of reference made up of unit vectors. How do I know they're one unit long? Well, I could square, 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 add square root, but I can see they're one unit long too, right? And then some people prefer to describe vector like minus one, four, two without the brackets by saying, take minus one copy of I, then add four copies of J and add, sorry, minus two copies of K. That was a minus sign. This is specifying the vector V in this frame of reference. And the reason I raise that with you today is because we will learn how to be flexible and use many frames of reference. This is just what people call the natural frame of reference, or some people call it the natural basis. Okay, really we're up against the end right here. I just want to scan to make sure I don't want to say anything else. I think I want to say one more thing that I should have said earlier, and I don't mind putting this out right here. I've scaled vectors. Well, naturally, I think you know that I can add them to. If I have two vectors, u and v, there is a very natural way to add them. I'll just take v and stick it on the end of u. It's like adding V to you. Or I could take U and stick it on the end of V. It probably end at the same place. Well, of course I have to in the same place. When I do that, this vector right here is called the vector U plus V. That's not earth shattering to you. You've probably seen vector addition before. What I want to point out and this is called the parallelogram law. This is the last thing we're gonna to say today. Is that I can add or subtract vectors. Many people have seen this drawing called the parallelogram law. Sometimes people are shy away from this drawing. When I draw the other diagonal here, this vector is U minus V. But I have to be careful with the direction. The direction of u plus v seems obvious. Take v, add it to the end of u, go from beginning to end. Where's u minus v? Does the arrow point up? Is the arrow point down? You have to learn. <coughs> and so you can learn in multiple ways, but the arrow belongs to that first arrowhead. So this is u minus v point in that direction. How do you know? u minus v plus v has to be what? Has to be u. So if I take u minus v and put it on the end of v, I better make u, so I do. So when someone says the parallelogram law, I just wanna point this out to you. Parallelogram law tells you how to add or subtract vectors geometrically. Of course, we can add or subtract by doing coordinates. And we'll focus more on that later. Okay, so let me tell you what I'm gonna do, get you oriented, and then you can get going. 
I want you to start looking at the problems in sections 2, 1, and 2, 2. 2, 1 was vectors in the plane, 2, 2 is vectors in the space. We kind of did them together or side by side. What I'm going to do is scan these sheets, upload this video, send a note to everybody so you get used to the system, and then we're going to go on from there. I do apologize that we didn't make a wise use of time because of the introduction, but that's just the nature of starting anything. That's just the nature of any kind of introduction. So we will discover and produce more next time. You guys dive in the website, dive in the recommended problems, dive into the homework, and I will see you next time. Now I'm gonna stop the recording. You're welcome to hang out and ask questions for a little while if you want to, but you do not have to stay here. I'm just gonna stop.